When people show up to work, they have a certain level of trust for their employer. Sometimes that's earned and sometimes it's just blind faith. And let's face it, with all that's been going on in the world, today's factory floor has many challenges that didn't exist just a few years ago. Award-winning professional engineer John Pushkar has spent his life trying to prevent fires and explosions at workplaces. Mr. Pushkar is offering this three-part series that spells out, in non-technical terms, hazards that might be found for those that operate or work near gas-fired equipment like bakery ovens, boilers, industrial ovens, or furnaces. The goal of these episodes is to put more knowledge about possible hazards in your hands so that you can have more of a role in protecting yourself at work. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. John, I understand that today's topic is all about starting up equipment. I'm guessing there could be much more to this than hitting just the start button. Welcome everyone, I'm John Pushkar from Prussian Technical Services, and I'm here today to give you more insights into how to stay safe in the world of fuels and combustion equipment. And Layla, that's great insight. There absolutely should be more than just hitting a start button. I don't care if you work at a bakery, a school where you're asked to start a boiler, or it's a large integrated steel facility and you're working on a reheat furnace. There absolutely has to be some sort of pre-start checklist, just like an airplane pilot before he takes off, that you go through before you hit that start button. And this is just one of the tips I'm going to cover for you here today. Is this something that would take a while? Would it require maybe some special training? Well, the real answer to that is that it depends. It depends on the type of equipment that you're trying to start up. But frankly, throughout 40 years of my experience doing this sort of thing, it really shouldn't take you more than about 15 minutes. I used to publish a document called 15 Minutes to Save Your Life for our regular customers. And what this would entail is, a pre-start walk-down procedure that's meant to be done with a team of people because it's really these different viewpoints that help you to get all of the perspectives you need to be safe. So what are some of the things that might be in a pre-start walk-down checklist? Well, first of all, let's start with the proper PPE, personal protective equipment. Should you have gloves on? Should you have FR clothing, fire-resistant clothing? Should you have safety glasses? What about the footwear that you're using? What about very basic communications between you and other shifts and you and maintenance folks? Did the equipment run properly the last time it performed? Was there maintenance performed recently? If so, why? What were the operational problems that existed? What should you be on the lookout for when you're operating this equipment? Next. Take an actual walk around the equipment. Ask some of your colleagues to join. Maybe it's a maintenance person. Maybe it's someone else in operations from a completely different piece of equipment. Maybe it's a supervisor. What will you look for? Simple things. If it happens to be some sort of boiler, you look for water leaks. Are there any scorch marks on the outside of the equipment indicating that maybe refractory has failed? What about instrument sensing lines? Are they all connected properly? What about linkages? Have any of them recently been moved? Do they look like they're secure? How about the combustion air fan? Does it have a filter? Is it clean? What about combustion air for the room? Are there louvers in the sidewall? Do they look like they're open? Are they full of debris? Are they capable of providing free airflow that you need to operate the equipment. Look at all of the switches, the high and low gas pressure switches. Do they look like they're set properly? What you should have done previously is you should have had folks mark on the switches what the proper set points are. 
with just a little bit of training, you can identify what the set point is and whether or not this set point is indeed set correctly. You want to do this on the low gas pressure switch, the high gas pressure switch, and the combustion air proving switch. Do you smell anything? Does there happen to be the smell possibly of a gas leak? Look at the flue. Is the flue connected properly? If you can get to the outside of the building and look up at the top of the stack, is there evidence of sooting? If you can do a dry light off attempt, meaning with the fuel sources isolated, maybe just the pilot system on, that's a great practice. You can watch linkages. You can make sure that purging is occurring correctly. You can see that you have good pilot signal strength. Maybe you do that, evaluate the pilot, and then you try to start again, and this time you allow it to go to main flame. And when it does this, it should start the main burner at low fire. Many burner management systems have a provision. There's a switch on them where you could lock the device such that it doesn't move through its firing range. It'll stay in whatever position it is when you push the little toggle switch. That's common, for example, to Honeywell 7800 series burner management systems. If you do this and you light low fire, you can hold it at low fire. You can evaluate the low fire flame, see what the signal strength is, make sure it's stable. Then you can release it to modulate and get to wherever it needs to be to satisfy the process parameters. When you light off, remember, it should only take two to three seconds to light a pilot and two or three seconds to light a main flame. These are things that you have to look for. So maybe you want to take some of the things I've spoken about here, document them, put, put them into a written procedure, discuss these things with other folks at your facility. Now you're on your way to having a pre-start light off checklist procedure. You're on your way to that 15 minutes to save your life. But there's a couple other things to consider. One is even where should you stand? In my investigations over the past 40 years of dozens of boiler explosions and fired equipment explosions, it's always the bolted stuff that seems to fly off. So never stand, for example, right in the front of a burner, never stand near the back door of a boiler, never stand near an explosion relief panel on some type of furnace or oven. Always stand off to the side or get away to a corner of something Get people out of the way. Remember, startups of any kind, well, they're never a spectator sport. Wow, I can see how it would be easy to overlook some of those issues when starting up. What if all those things check out and the equipment for some reason doesn't want to light off? Layla, that's a great point, and frankly, it does happen. Most of the clients I work with, well, they've got a policy about allowing only two light off attempts before they stop, let the equipment air out, and get someone involved from a maintenance team that has the knowledge and experience to do the proper troubleshooting. Air out, you say. Why would you need to air out? Well, I have modules that can teach you about what actually happens during the light off sequence, but let me tell you that every time you hit that start button and you purge and you try to light off a pilot or try to light off a main flame, a small amount of fuel is released. If you happen to try to do light off after light off, and you happen to have a problem with the pre-purge, maybe there's dirt on the fan, maybe someone compromised the timing of the purge for some strange reason, we don't know. If these things happen, you don't get a proper full purge, you will accumulate flammable materials in the firebox until one of those startup attempts ends up with a huge explosion. And folks, it's happened many, many times. John, this was very informative. And even though I have never had a startup more than just a barbecue grill, if I ever had to, I feel a lot more prepared. Thank you so much for passing on this information. Layla, thank you for this interview. I think we've done some good for a lot of people. Folks, if you're out there listening to this, and you want some help creating that just wonderful, best in class, 15 minutes to save your life procedure, I'm here to help. I've got some great insights for specific types of equipment that you might be using. 
and I'm happy to work with your team and share. Again, remember, like I always say, be safe out there because the life you save, it just might be yours. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.